The Paul is Dead hoax is one of the strangest stories in rock history. It almost doesn't seem real. But for two months in the fall of 1969, college students all across the United States were obsessed with discovering hidden messages on Beatles album covers and in the songs themselves. At the height of its popularity, the conspiracy theory spread around the world, spawning novelty songs, write-ups, and even primetime TV news coverage. On today's episode of Strange and Unusual Tales, we're going to dive into the history of one of music's biggest urban legends and see if there's any truth to the rumor that Paul McCartney died in 1966. Together, collectively, they thought Paul McCartney had died. I understand that they still do. McCartney was killed three years ago in an auto accident and a double put in his place. The gist of the theory is that after an argument during a Beatles recording session on November 9th, 1966, Paul McCartney sped off in his car only to be decapitated in an auto accident when he lost control of his vehicle. The UK security service MI5 advised the band to find a replacement for they feared that if the news of Paul's death got out, mass hysteria would spread among Beatles fans, leading to civil unrest and possible mass suicide. The band held a Paul McCartney lookalike contest and the winner was a Scottish orphan named William Shears Campbell, otherwise known as Billy Shears. After undergoing some minor plastic surgery, the Beatles taught him how to sing, act, and play music just like Paul. Luckily for Billy, his job was made easier by the fact that the Beatles recently retired from touring and they were all set to don a new look for their upcoming album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. It's unknown how this theory got started, but the earliest printed mention of the rumor was in the February 1967 issue of Beatles Book Monthly. It was a small one paragraph article that dispelled a small rumor that Paul was killed in a car accident on the 7th of January 1967. This seemed to quell the rumor for some time until the fall of 1969 when the rumor resurfaced. At first, it was just a story told at parties on college campuses across the U.S. But then a caller phoned a popular Detroit radio station and got DJ Russ Gibb to play some Beatles music that contained hidden messages live on the air. One of those listening that afternoon was college student Fred Laborde, and the story gave him an idea. He was tasked with writing a review of the newly released Abbey Road album, and instead of doing the same old track-by-track -track article, he decided to look deeper into the conspiracy and see if the Beatles' latest record held any clues of Paul's death. To his amazement, the cover alone was ripe with evidence. He wrote up what he found, and the story was published in the university newspaper on October 14th. His article was quickly picked up by other college papers and radio stations in both the US and the UK. Suddenly the rumors spread like a wildfire and fans became alarmed and wanted answers. The Beatles management office was bombarded with questions of Paul's health, receiving nearly 3,000 phone calls a day. When McCartney was asked to confirm to the press that he was very much alive, he refused to give the rumor any credence, believing that the whole thing would just die down on its own. Paul just wanted to be left alone and live a quiet family life on his farm. News outlets couldn't confirm nor deny the rumor, so they ran with the story. This resulted in the conspiracy becoming a mainstream topic of concern, producing many newspaper articles, opinion pieces, and novelty songs. Eager to get the final say on the matter, a group of reporters from Life magazine trespassed on the McCartney Scottish farm during the last week of October. Paul was furious and initially chased them away, but after realizing the photographers captured some unflattering photos of himself, he called them back and agreed to an interview in exchange for the negatives. Paul became the cover story for the November 7th issue, and that seemed to settle the matter once and for all, with the rumor all but dying out after the magazine was published. Now, the bulk of the evidence for this theory revolves around the idea that the remaining Beatles were racked with guilt over hiding Paul's death, and so they left clues of the cover-up for the fans to discover. I don't have time in this video to cover every clue found since 1969, so instead my focus will be on the ones most widely cited at the height of the rumor's popularity. And we'll start with the first album since Paul's supposed death, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Now the cover seems innocent enough until you look deeper and you see what others have described as a funeral. The Beatles are Paul bearers as they are all turned towards him with Paul facing front dead on. The British comedian Izzy Bond holds his open palm above Paul's head, signifying death in Eastern mysticism. 
Paul is the only member holding a black instrument, also a death indication. If you hold a mirror to the bass drum head, it reveals a hidden message. The number one plus the word one stands for the 11th month or November. Then we see the Roman numeral for nine. This represents the day Paul died, November 9th, with the following message, he died, reinforcing this theory. As we move down the album, we see what appears to be a freshly buried grave with the shape of a left-handed guitar made out of flowers. Paul was the only left-handed member of the group, and if you look closely, you can see that the flowers spell out Paul question mark. Opening up the gatefold, we find a delightful picture of the Fab Four, but Paul has a patch on his shoulder with the letters OPD. Many believe this stands for officially pronounced dead, which is the British equivalent of DOA or dead on arrival. Moving to the back of the album, the only Beatle with his back to us is Paul. Coincidence? Perhaps. But look where George is pointing. It's a lyric from She's Leaving Home. Wednesday morning at 5 a.m., the supposed time of Paul's death. The weird thing is, November 9th fell on a Wednesday in 1966. As we play the record, our first big piece of evidence happens right as the title track ends. You can hear the Beatles sing Billy Shears. On side two, the song A Day in a Life strongly alludes to Paul's death. He blew his mind out in a car. On the cover of their follow-up record, Magical Mystery Tour, Paul is the only member dressed in black and standing in a crucifixion pose, both strong indications of death. Looking above, if we connect the stars together, a phone number is revealed. Depending on how you look at it, you could get one of a dozen different numbers. When calling one of these on a Wednesday at 5 a.m. or 5 p.m., some people claim to get cryptic messages on the other end or actually talk to Billy Shears. Opening up the U.S. version of Magical Mystery Tour, we are greeted by a 24-page booklet full of clues, including four instances of hands above Paul's head. The first being on page 14, then in cartoon form on page 15, then again on page 18, and finally on page 24. On page 3, we see Paul with the message in front of him saying, I was. On the centerfold, we see Paul is the only one without shoes. His shoes have blood stains on them, and they are just above page number 13. But perhaps the most obvious clue is on page 23. Paul is the only one wearing a black flower, another symbol of death. Turning to the music towards the end of I Am the Walrus, buried deep in the cacophony, we can just barely hear voices reciting the death of Oswald from Shakespeare's King Lear. But even more brazen, when you play this section backwards, you can hear the demonic chanting, Paul is dead, ha ha. <laughs> Flipping over to side two, Strawberry Fields Forever reveals what appears to be John saying, I buried Paul. While the White Album itself lacks any visual clues, looking at the included poster, we find the only known photo of Billy Shears, pre-plastic surgery. Moving on to the music, the song Glass Onion contains a very obvious wink to the fans, as if John is confirming they're on to something. Well, here's another clue for you. At the end of I'm So Tired, we hear some gibberish. But when we play this backwards, we hear John say, Paul is dead man, miss him, miss him, miss him. Finally, if we play the beginning of Revolution 9 backwards, we hear probably the most convincing piece of evidence, turn me on, dead man. Yellow Submarine provides almost no clues other than yet another hand above Paul. Moving on to Abbey Road, the cover shows the Beatles walking away from what appears to be a cemetery. John leads a procession dressed in white, looking Christ-like with his long hair. Ringo follows, dressed in black, resembling an undertaker. Paul walks behind, out of step with the rest of the Beatles, and holding a cigarette in his right hand, contrary to the real Paul, who is left-handed. This Paul is also barefoot, suggesting a corpse. George takes up the rear, dressed in denim, resembling a gravedigger. 
The Volkswagen Beetle in the background has a license plate 28IF, representing that Paul would be in his 28th year in 1969 if he was still alive. On the back, we find a series of dots that if you connect them, form the number three, which then reads three Beatles. Even that Life magazine interview wasn't enough for some theorists, as it was soon discovered that when you held up the cover to a strong light, the Mercury car ad on the other side can be seen running through the body of Paul. And while most of the Paul is Dead proponents thought the Beatles were behind the rumor, there was a small subset that believed Capitol Records started the hoax as an elaborate publicity stunt to sell more records. And it's true that one unattended benefit of the rumor was a surge in Beatles album sales. Fans ended up buying multiple copies, often destroying their records when they played them backwards in search of more clues. Capital knew the hoax was making them money, so they did nothing to stop it and had no shame capitalizing on the rumor themselves. And speaking of Capital, some Paul is Dead believers found clues on the compilation album Yesterday and Today. On the recalled cover, Paul is in the center, covered in meat and the bodies of headless baby dolls both clearly an indication of his horrific car accident. On the reissued cover, everything looks innocent enough until you turn the record sideways, and now Paul is in a coffin. The only problem with using either of these covers is that they were made and released while the real Paul was still alive, which brings us to the rebuttals. While these clues are entirely thought-provoking and some are quite convincing, there has to be a simpler explanation. And so let's go back to Sgt. Pepper's. If we look at the outtake photos from the cover shoot, we can clearly see how they tried many different poses. Paul isn't always holding the clarinet. Sometimes it's a brass instrument. And notice how Paul moves around the set. He's not always in the middle, nor does he always stand under the supposed death hand. For a number of shots, Ringo takes his place. As for the other appearances of hands above Paul's head, this is pure coincidence. Also, there's no evidence of hands above head signifying anything to do with death or the dead. The date on the bass drum head doesn't hold up when you convert it to the UK standard format of day, month, then year. So it would actually read September 11th, which is a whole other can of worms. And while Paul didn't die on November 9th, it is an important date for John Lennon, as that's the day he met Yoko Ono at the Indica Gallery in London. As for the guitar made of flowers, according to photographer Peter Blake, that was an impromptu suggestion from one of the assistants during the shoot. The arrangement of flowers forming the word Paul is also a coincidence. And for Paul's OPD patch, when we look at alternate gatefold photos, we can clearly see that the patch actually stands for Ontario Provincial Police, or OPP. And again, the back cover photo was simply the favorite choice out of a series of photos. So any connection or meaning was purely coincidental. Same goes for where George is pointing. Moving to the music, the simplest explanation for the Beatles singing Billy Shears is that it's a rhyme for years, as Paul told Rolling Stone magazine in 1974. As for A Day in a Life, the car crash illusions in that song were based on the death of Tara Brown, who died when he crashed his sports car into a lamppost. The cover of Magical Mystery Tour is easily debunked by the fact that if you actually watch the TV special, it becomes abundantly clear that the walrus was actually John, not Paul. Now, the special wasn't widely available in the US until the 1970s, so this misunderstanding is forgivable. But wait a minute, if John really was the walrus, why would he sing otherwise on Glass Onion? Well, in an interview for Playboy magazine, John says he wrote that line as a joke, as he was feeling guilty for choosing Yoko over Paul. Not to mention, Glass Onion was written in 1968, well before the fervor of the Paul is Dead rumor. As for the phone number on the cover of Magical Mystery Tour, there never really was one obvious set of numbers that you could decipher from the stars. There was several numbers. So if this really was a clue for the fans, you'd think they would make this much clearer so there wouldn't be any confusion as to what phone number to call. Turning to page three of the booklet, the message in front of him should actually read, I, you, was. Bad English for sure, but not so much a death clue. Paul without his shoes on isn't a symbol of death, but more a reflection of his personal choice. Who knows, maybe his feet get really hot all the time. I don't know. As for the shoes having blood stains, isn't it far more likely that it's a reflection of the red bass drum that they're next to? As for them being above page 13, a lucky coincidence. But what about that black flower Paul is wearing? 
Well, he said in his Life magazine interview that they ran out of red flowers. Now, this doesn't really explain away all doubt, as he can be clearly seen dancing with a bouquet of red flowers in the special. Now, the section of King Lear heard on I Am The Walrus was recorded on the fly. Pure coincidence. They literally turned on the radio while they were mixing that song, and it just so happened to capture that scene. The backwards section is really up to interpretation, and it says more about the power of suggestion than actually saying Paul is dead. But what about John saying I buried Paul at the end of Strawberry Fields Forever? Well, if you listen to an alternate take on the Beatles Anthology 2, you can clearly hear him say, Cranberry Sauce. Moving on to the White Album, the photo of Billy Shears is more likely just McCartney wearing glasses. Maybe it's even a passport photo. The backwards message at the end of I'm So Tired doesn't say Paul is dead, man, miss him, but it's actually forwards with John saying, Monsieur, Monsieur, how about another one? Beatles biographer, historian, and authority Mark Lewinson confirmed this when he listened to the master tapes. However, I can't explain away the eerie coincidence of Turn Me On, Dead Man on Revolution 9. It is what it is. Moving on to Abbey Road, Fred Labor admits to making up all the clues he listed in his 1969 newspaper article. As for Paul being barefoot, it was a hot day out and he kicked off his sandals to be more comfortable. Outtake photos confirm this and they also dispel any significance with the way he's walking. They only took six photos for the cover and the one with Paul at a step simply looked the best. As for the Volkswagen, photographer Ian McMillan states that they tried to get it moved for the photo but the owner couldn't be found. Since they were blocking traffic to take the photo, there wasn't enough time to get it towed, and so the car stayed. And by the way, the license plate actually reads 281F. But what about the first Paul is Dead rumor back in 1967? Paul's Mini Cooper was involved in an accident, but he wasn't in the car. He was being driven by Robert Fraser's assistant while Paul was traveling in another car with Mick Jagger. As for the accident that supposedly killed Paul on November 9th, 1966, there's no evidence of one occurring, and it's well documented that Paul was on vacation during this time. Paul did crash his moped in December of 65, but he only suffered a chipped tooth and a scar on his upper lip, which ultimately led to him wanting to grow a mustache to hide the scar. As for Capitol Records being behind the stunt, they deny any involvement, claiming they had no publicity people that could come up with something so elaborate. And after 50 years, no one who worked for Capitol has ever come forward to say otherwise. Guilty of butchering Beatles albums, oh yes, butchering Paul, not so much. In the end, I think it's nearly impossible to find someone that could resemble Paul McCartney so well, but also be as talented as him, and then go on to have the career he did after the Beatles. Not to mention all the people involved to keep the cover-up a secret, from management to close friends and significant others. Any one of them could have made millions by spilling the beans, yet no one has. But for me, the most convincing argument I've read against the Paul is Dead theory is that the clues are only clues if you're looking for them with the idea of Paul's death. Meaning, there really isn't a clue that outright says Paul is dead. And I know, I know I did state two clues that seem to say otherwise, but you really have to stretch the imagination to hear Paul's name. It's all up to interpretation and wishful thinking. You hear what you want to hear. Ultimately, I'm sure you could come up with clues that fit any narrative you want, like the Beatles were really Satanists. I mean, Aleister Crowley is on the cover of Sgt. Pepper's after all. Paul himself still gets asked about the whole fiasco, and for the most part, he takes it in stride, often playing into it. But it was a little bit strange, because people did start looking at me like... Right. <laughs> is it... is it him? Yeah. Or... A very good double. Or making fun of it as he did on his live album from 93, even down to the Beatle having the license plate of 51 is, as he was 51 in 1993. Though direct references to the rumor seem to have died down in recent years, you'd be hard pressed to find someone unaware of its lasting effects on popular culture. I mean, the very idea of playing a record backwards to reveal hidden messages owes a large debt to this very conspiracy theory. Thank you all so much for watching. I'm your Vinyl Geek, and I'll catch you on the flip side.